is, is this parish of sound, and it kind of kind of sounds loud enough down here. Can you get enough up there? It's a different channel, remember. If we want to, we can increase that if you need. A little bit. One, two, three, four. It's nice that we did this. More? More. Oh, hang on. Enter now. I could see this. Testing one, two, three, four. Still not happy. One more. A little bit. All right. This is to the green light. One, two, three, four. Can we go with it? You know, you want more? All right. Huh. Very interesting. All right. That's as hot as we have. One, two, three, four. Is there a signal going out? Some? Not. I beg your pardon? Is there a signal going out? Is there something on the side going up and down? Let's go with it. Thank you. It's hard to get everything to work. Why, Mariah, you're here with us. How nice. Mariah was, how long, a year and a half? Teaching the kids, and now she's here with us. I'm happy to be here, happy to be alive. Hmm. Please let us take a moment to turn to a neighbor and share one reason you're happy you're alive this morning. Just a couple of minutes. One, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, four, one, two, one, two. That may be way too loud now. Is it okay? Too loud. How's that now? Is that okay? Good. I, I was using the wrong. Is it adequate? One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four.
Let's see, is there a signal with that now? Good or higher? <laughs> Here we go, higher in the room and good enough up there. I had the wrong microphone. <laughs> so when you have the other microphone and you're turning the controls for this microphone, Ah, oh, details, details, details. Jeez. So, we have the extraordinarily amazing privilege of being alive and breathing this morning. So let's revel in it. Let's just delight in the fact of breathing. And we can do that by paying attention. So notice, as I like to say, that not so very long ago a sperm and an egg came together and the miracles happened and then you were born and then you gasped. <sighs> and everyone in the room relaxed. <laughs> Whew. She breathed. He breathed. And since then, till now, there's been this breathing in and breathing out. And any moment that we are attentive to the body now, we're not lost in the trance of I, I, me, me, mine, mine. We're not lost in the past or the future. We're just here breathing in and breathing out. So I think that's why the Buddha chose to have mindfulness of in-breathing and out-breathing as the first practice, as the, as the foundational practice. So, have the eyes open or the eyes closed? What an absolute mystery and miracle it is. The body breathes, awareness can be present in it. Of course, the mind is profoundly conditioned. And so it seduces us away from the present into fantasies of past and future, into emotion, identification with emotions and moods. But we have this extraordinary gift called mindfulness. This way in which the mind can be aware of itself, can be aware of the body, can be aware of the sense doors. So let's sit here in silence for a while, bringing awareness back into the sensations in the body of breathing. But stopping any struggle there may be. Just as we have the war on some drugs, and the war on this and the war on that. 
We don't need a war on the wandering mind. It, like all wars, fails. Instead, let's practice radical acceptance or profound willingness. When awareness discovers that the mind has wandered off, that's the moment of awakening. And then from there, let's come home to the sensations of breathing.
in addition to mindfulness, presence, and the sensations of the breath, It also serves us to be curious. It's not a failure when the mind wanders, but it is a very curious circumstance, isn't it? I make the intention to stay attentive to the breath and the mind has a different plan. It's worrying or lost in some emotion or having a conversation with someone or having a conversation with ourselves or criticizing ourselves or thinking about something we read this morning. What a strange thing. And so we become aware of that too, that the mind has a mind of its own. And it's really quite crazy much of the time. Fortunately, it doesn't really matter. Because awareness of the restless, crazy mind is the awareness, it's the awakening process. Every breath has a beginning, a rising to fullness and then a disappearance, decline and vanishing. With every breath we have the paradigm of birth, life and death.
sounds arise and then they disappear. One of the great strengths of this practice is that it can be done effectively everywhere under every condition. The practice center that I visited for a while in Burma, in Rangoon, was on one of the busiest streets in the city. There were car horns and bus noises and street vendors. All just the stuff of hearing. Here we're blessed with really remarkable quiet. Makes it easier for us. Breathing in happens and awareness joins the sensations at the first nanosecond. Even before breathing in starts, there's this impulse to breathe, this thirst, hunger for breathing. And then breathing begins and rises to fullness and changes direction and declines and then utterly vanishes. And then there's just awareness. Or there's the sensations of the body touching the chair or the hands touching. Or the mind awakening from some wandering, some obsession.
It's common to end a period of sitting practice with a gong. This can give us an unskillful message, however. Or we can hear it as meaning meditation is over. It's a bit like saying breathing is over. It's likely to continue for a while. So instead of a gong, I'd like us all to please become aware that there's a body sitting here. Notice how alive it is. Where is it cool? Where is it warm? Where is there pressure? Notice that there can be awareness of where the clothing is touching. And let's not take for granted the fact of this awareness. We can't literally be aware of awareness, but we can tacitly know that it exists. It's that which lights up or illuminates or senses all the experiences of life. Awareness. We can notice <clears throat> When the mind falls asleep or wanders off, there's a, a diminution of a certain kind of awareness, which is mindfulness. Please become aware of your face, of the eyes in particular, as a physical experience. And let your eyes roll around inside their beautifully lubricated little sockets. It's not so much let them, it's command them, will them, intend them. And please now observe in the mind the intention prompted by this voice the intention to allow or to activate the opening of the eye shutters, the eyelids. And notice awareness of seeing as it arises. Seeing. Seeing comes with objects, with color, form. And in this way, why not continue meditating for the rest of our lives? This body has built up some tension in the neck and shoulders, so I'm going to give it permission to stretch that. I invite you to do the same. Where? If you do it slowly, really paying attention, it becomes a, cer a sort of feast, a feast of aliveness. And isn't it interesting that stretching is a pain that feels really good? So let's have one show of hands. Do you feel, please raise your hand if you feel more relaxed, at ease, sane, or comfortable in your skin than you did when you walked in. 
Take a look around. This is a huge intervention into our lives. It's not ho-hum, I think I'll go meditate for a while. It's, I think I'll go and alter my state of consciousness and body radically. And to further this into activity, Mr. Dalton, are you prepared to take the, take the helm, sir? A battery, but I think it's okay. I heard Jim Dalton say to me, what's up? <laughs> Life is getting weirder and weirder. That's a first. That's a first. <laughs> All right, here we are standing, <clears throat> aware of the feet on the floor, aware of the pressure of the feet, or the pressure sensation at the floor. Let's go up on our toes a little bit and back on our heels and feel that uh, <clears throat> alternating rhythm of pressing against the force of gravity and then relaxing into it. You know, lifting and settling down. <clears throat> So I've been playing with the uh, four elements in my practice lately. Earth, water, air, and fire. <clears throat> and what started in human history as an investigation of four elements of matter has developed into how many items listed on the periodic table. Weren't there two more added just recently? Somebody did something in a laboratory and it expanded someone's consciousness. I don't know. It went right over my head. Okay, but <clears throat> when we started all this investigation into the elements, the, the earth was an element of heaviness. It was not out there in matter someplace. Earth is the feeling of deepening and uh, settling and connecting to the earth. And so there's a heaviness, there's a pressure, and we can feel it in the soles of our feet. Uh, <clears throat> as people watched the, the fires in group activities, they noticed that these heavy logs were turned into light through fire. And so fire became this, this label for the subjective sensation of rising and lightening <clears throat> and feeling lighter, feeling brighter, rising. So we, we come up because there is an element of fire in the body. We have the fire to lift. We allow the lifting to grow out of the heaviness of the earth. So there's an alternating current. <clears throat> Earth going down and fire coming up. 
Now there's a <coughs> Qigong exercise where you lift gradually and then you drop. And <coughs> the difference between the lifting is that there's cohesiveness and then there's this solid thump going down. So that's like uh, water flowing and then earth. <laughs> and <coughs> if we move our arms, there's motion and there's <coughs> movement and uh, the air, the wind was a symbol of that, but it was also a, a, a subjective sensation. I can set my imagination in some way to imitate the birds, for instance, and just wave my wings out to the side. So these four elements are here with us every moment, and one or the other may be predominant, or there might be a fusion. You know how Jack Cornfield talks about uh, multiple hindrance attacks. There can be multiple elemental uprisings. So let's sink into the earth <clears throat> and then feel the fire rising and feel the cohesiveness of the signals to the muscles and the nerves. There's just one following another in this cohesive pattern. And there's a cohesiveness in the joints. We're made of four elements and one or the other is going to be do, you know, predominant, or maybe not. Maybe maybe you can be aware of a multiple <clears throat> a multiple um, arising. Let's lift and open again. Without the water element, the shoulders can't softly drop. Open forward, open sideways. There's water as a subjective feeling in this second movement of Qigong. But there's also air. The lungs, are the capacity of the lungs changes. And there can be more lightness and playfulness. We can paint a rainbow. But feel the cohesive response. In order for my arm to go across the sky, everything down to my toes has to respond in a cohesive, connected, watery, flowing manner. Reaching up separating the clouds there's <clears throat> again a, we have this image in our minds of round smooth movement and that our nervous system is cohesive it sends a nice mellow pattern of impulses through to create that arc And then we come down to the earth. And we'll open to the side, feel this twisting. It's a different kind of movement. So then we have to use the mind to say, what is a twist? It's watery movement in the hips, one side contracting, the other side opening so which element is predominant as you <coughs> lift back and then come down the front connecting to the earth Lifting across, cohesive. The heel lifting is connected to the tip of the finger rising. The 
the rising of the arm is connected to the firmness felt in the supporting sole of the foot. So earth, air, water, and fire aren't out there. They're right in here, stretching across with one arm, pulling back with the other. That twist is back. It's a little more complicated, but it's a combination of elements. As we press across, there's movement from the hips through the spine, up past the shoulder blades, out the arm, into the fingertips. It all connects because of the water element. And as the weight shifts, you feel the earth on one foot and then on the other. Here's where my system broke down. I couldn't track everything. Cloud hands. <laughs> There's too many things going on. So the Buddha used four elements to teach mindfulness of the body. And then three or four hundred years later, the Mahayanists developed a further teaching method. And they added a fifth thing called space. And I think that works for the cloud hands. The whole thing, all the elements are fused into a space right around the body that we inhabit with the cloud, with the shadow on the earth, with the breathing, with the feelings in the bottoms of the feet. We occupy this space in a really special way. All right, we're going to change the position, <clears throat> put one foot in front of the other a little bit and splash in the sea. And it's hard to keep track of which particular element is predominant here. We've got the integration. Again, we're creating space. Riding the waves. The waves flow through space. With cohesion, resistance to gravity, surrender to gravity, movement, they're all there. Opening. So the fifth element is space. Body space. What are the boundaries of this body when it does these movements? Step to the other side. Splash in the sea. Riding the waves. Opening the arms. Mm. 
Okay, coming back to the center. <clears throat> we'll sink, make a fist, let the dragon rise from the sea. So the imagination integrates the elements into images that guide cohesive movement. And then up on the toes, we can soar with the cranes, the eagles. And then turn the wheel. Integrating everything. Changing direction. And coming back to the center, <clears throat> we feel the calmness and surrender to the earth. But then playfulness, we can lift one arm and one leg and create a complex space, lots of things going on. How do we balance? How do we coordinate the arm and the leg? How do we connect with the earth with the foot that's planted? And then the simple, simple space is right here. Up the center of the body and down the center of the body. Coolness coming in with the breath, warmth moving out. stillness, but the space element is still there. The entire body, all the space of the body is filled with sensation. <clears throat> so we come to rest from all the postures and gestures and just be curious which element is predominant in the awareness now does it continue does it fade away does it open up to another different element can we pause and just soak in one element and just let the Awareness wander freely to find another. Soak it in, release it. All taking place in the body space. open and free. And then deliberately taking a full breath and releasing another full breath and hold it. What are the predominant elements here? Release. And one more holding. And release. Then bring our hands together in gratitude for 
time to practice together. And last week, Kate and I made an error with my schedule. I'm not going to be here on April 9th. I'm going to be here on April 16th to do Qigong and meditation on Saturday for four hours. So if you're interested in more practice, come join us. Hiya. What's up? <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. If any of you were getting sleepy, I think we fixed that. So welcome everyone. How many of you are here for the first time today? Anybody? Oh great, welcome. Glad to see you. My name is Kate and I actually work here. Um, I have a little office at the back of the building and I'm here between 9 to 2 Tuesday through Friday. So if any of you need me for any reason, I'm around. We have a couple of retreats coming up in Seattle on April 8th. And that's just, that's a couple days. That's a weekend retreat with Robert. And all of the information you need about um, retreats and activities, they're all on our website at portlandinsight.org. So if you are interested, keep an eye on the website. Or, hi, Misty. Or there's a blue sheet at the back of the room, and you can sign up either to be on the PIMC forum, which is where we talk to one another, or you can be on just our email list so you just get notices. There's another 12-day retreat in Nelson, British Columbia in July. Uh, it will change your life and it's um, magnificent. It's a lovely thing to do for yourself and I encourage you to consider it. It, it is transformative. Um, there's also a, um, a retreat in June. Uh, is it Brighton Bush in June? And the Brighton Bush retreats tend to fill up rather quickly, so I would encourage you to start thinking about that if you have any interest. Um, we do have Dharma consults. If you have a question about your practice or something you'd like to know more about, um, the Dharma teachers take turns doing Dharma consults, 20-minute consults, in this little room after the Dharma talk, and I'll be doing them today. So if you have anything that's on your mind, there's a sign-up sheet at the back of the room. Also, uh, Robert offers free half-hour Dharma consultations, and if you would like to get a little chunk of his time, uh, give me a buzz, and I will get you scheduled. Um, we have a new teacher, Monica, for the children's program, and I would like to encourage you. We have been having more and more children, and uh, if you are taking advantage of the children's program, please consider volunteering. Uh, we could really use another parent or volunteer. Um, if you could consider doing once every six weeks even, that would be wonderful. But even if you're not a parent, it's a great gift. I don't know of any group of people really who need a respite more than the parents of small children. <laughs> Having been there. We have a potluck today. It looks like the entire spread is sweets. I encourage you to come, come and enjoy it. Come through this door to our living room. And, uh, you know, that's why they call it potluck. And you don't have to take responsibility for eating sweets because that's all there is. <laughs> the mind is a wonderful thing to allow us to. I think that's all I have. Jim, when's your next... Uh, 16th, April 16th, Jim does a wonderful, like, half-day retreat, Qigong retreat, which is wonderful. Yes? Oh, yeah, the work program. Do you want to talk about it? Hi, 
in the room hear me okay? Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Paul. I'm one of the volunteer coordinators here. And uh, we're going to be doing a karma yoga work party next week, Saturday, uh, April 2nd. We're going to be starting at about 10 a.m. And the idea behind the karma, work, karma yoga work party, um, I mean, yes, we have this list of things we want to get done. Um, but the idea is to sort of pull away from the illusion of completing the tasks. Um, and I've always found that, that for me at least, um, the, the act of volunteering can dovetail beautifully with the practice in that you're there to be a part of the task, be a part of the community, to engage in the process and to be mindful throughout. And it's, it's you know, when we were doing the, the Qigong and the movement, if you've ever done walking meditation, it's not really much different than that. So, um, and, and then it's, it's just a, a ton of fun. You get to meet all kinds of different people. You know, some of us come, some of us go, some of us can stay. Uh, so, um, you know, from a you know, week to week basis. But at the work party, you may be paired up with somebody, maybe working next to somebody you've never met before. And it's a great opportunity to just hang out and meet each other, and then you switch tasks. There's something else needs to be done. And so the, the idea is not to focus on completion. The idea is to focus on the process, mindfulness of cleaning a window, mindfulness of pulling weeds, things like that. Um, so just some details. Um, so we're going to be starting at 10 a.m. There's no requirement for anyone to, to be here throughout the whole day. You don't have to sign up. You don't have to make any major commitments. If you can't make it at 10, come a little later. Um, if you can't stay the whole day, take off, that's fine by us. Um, even if you only do one task, it's super, it's wonderful because it's one last task for someone else to have to deal with at some other point. So um, again, it's, it's about just coming and doing what you can, even if it's just one thing, really, it really helps us out. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I, I sent this message out. You know, somebody just decided they wanted to take care of the garden out back. Um, didn't tell anybody, didn't ask, just showed up and did it, and it was beautiful and wonderful, and it's one less thing for us to have to, to, to work with on, uh, on Saturday. So um, dress accordingly. Um, we're going to be doing a lot of cleaning and a lot of gardening, so you know, wear your scrubby stuff if you can. And if it's raining, I'd like to try and soldier through. Um, so if you're not adverse to working in the rain, bring your rain gear, and uh, you know, we'll still try to figure something out to, to do in the rain as long as it's safe. I got some things on the roof. I'm, that's been bugging me for several months. So if it's raining, no roof work, no. So, um, uh, what else? Lunch. Oh yeah, lunch. Lunch will be provided. However, I know some people feel compelled to bring things anyway, so just, just don't make a big production out of it. You know, just <laughs> if you wanna bring some snacks, that's fine, but we will prov provide lunch for everyone. Um, Oh, and then uh, some gardening tools. You know, if you have some work gloves, if you're, if you're interested in working outside, bring your gardening gloves. We have a few things. Um, we're just not fully complemented in tools. So just, you know, throw a couple of things in your trunk if you can, if you feel so inclined. Just make sure and mark it and, you know, so that you don't lose it here because we will absorb it. So. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. So I'll just take one more minute. We don't... There is no way every week to thank all the volunteers who do what they do. Um, there's just no way. But Marla, the flowers are extraordinary again. Liberty, I love you up there. Um, most of what gets done is not seen. And for those, all of you who do work unseen, thank you. It makes this place loving, warm, and sparkly. Oh, Robert. I know. They're having fun. Well, they're pushing each other down the slide. Too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>
back to a more secure with a big clock. There. Not very bright. There we go. <sighs> wow. How beautiful, how delicious to be here with you today. I was away for a week with my family, visiting friends and skiing in Colorado. Had some remarkable altered state experiences. One was skiing through the trees in very deep powder snow and falling and taking a long time to get up. Minutes, panting completely. Quite another world than sitting here in this ease and comfort. And, and there was another other world which was that I traveled. I had that incredible privilege to travel on an airplane yesterday. And it always, I've flown many, many times in my life, but I'm always rather stunned at the privilege and the beauty of it. We flew north out of Denver, north, kind of north, northwest, and the Rockies just went on and on and on. It's so huge. And as I was drifting along up there at 34,000 feet, I found myself remembering my parents and the particular in instance with my parents. It was a long time ago. They were, my son was six months old, so it was 33 and a half years ago. And um, they came to visit. The only time they ever came to Portland was to visit that time. And I took them to the airport and we did our usual parting where my dad coughed to cover his tears and my mother teared and I teared and I hugged my mother and by then I'd learned to shake my father's hand. That I'd, I'd forced him to hug me for long enough and I finally realized that what, how he was more comfortable was. And then they turned and they went into that little tube, the big tube, the jetway as they call it, and then they disappeared, and I stood there and watched as the plane pulled away, and then it went out onto the runway, and then it took off, and I watched as it turned into a speck. And then it just, first it was a speck, and then I could see it again, and then it was a speck, and I couldn't find it again, and then they were gone. Now I had a story that they were gone and they were going to Chicago and then Montreal where they lived, <clears throat> but they disappeared from my direct experience. And I remember reflecting many times, I wonder what it will be like when they die. And then one by one, they did. My father to a heart attack probably, and my mother of pneumonia I got to be there with my mother's passing and she was so hot, she was 105 degrees, 106 degrees. They asked her, she'd been in the nursing home for five years, and they asked her, uh, they said to her, Eleanor, if you take these pills, you will likely survive. And the nurse said, I heard her teeth snap shut across the room. So the that was in Vancouver, BC, there was time to get there and uh, I was with her when she, when she opened her eyes and looked and then whew, gone. So I invite you to reflect upon your own disappearance and then to take a moment to look around this room with the realization that everyone in here will disappear. We'll leave behind a corpse, but we will vanish. We will die. And all those beautiful little children out there will also die. Mine come to mind and I think, oh, it's a hard thought. 
In fact, everyone we know and every human being on the planet will die. 150,000 people are dying today. Three hundred thousand are being born today. That's kind of why we're in a problem. <laughs> <laughs> the, ma the math of that adds rather fast. People have noticed this coming and goingness since the beginning because we become very attached to each other. We become very attached to our own participation. Oh, I forgot. Hundreds of billions of other living creatures will die today. Right. As Ramdas put it, central casting is a very busy place. When big tragedies occur, like you know, the tsunami and 120,000 people or so die, it's not even that big of a test for central casting because they're used, to, they're used to large volumes. So this death thing is really real. And we as humans have created, We've been curious about this for a long time. It's, it's, it's a very deep, important question that we have. And we've created answers to the question, which have come down to us in the form of religions. And when one thinks about insight meditation, as I do often, <laughs> There's three levels of application. The first is stress management, and mindfulness-based stress reduction is a big deal. Millions of people around the world, particularly in the West, are learning to meditate in order to be healthier, and it really works. It's powerful. Some people come through these doors with recommendations from physicians or come to see me individually because they, they need to learn how to be less stressed. And it works, it works really well. There's another level which is psychological and emotional well-being where we learn to observe the emotions, the, the depression and the anxiety and the fears and, and the stories that we tell ourselves and to examine the malware, the malware which has to do with self-hatred and other hatred and, and uh, the desperate uh, fears that come, the paranoias and, and uh, obsessions. And though mindfulness teaches us to become aware of them as objects rather than who I am. So there then is anxiety or fear or jealousy. Or, and, and so that cool, we, can, we can help cool that out. And that's another realm of tremendous application at this point. Western psychology is being revolutionized by mindfulness. And then there's that third level, which is the level where the question is, who am I? Who am I? Where did I come from? Where will I go? What am I supposed to be doing? But who am I? <laughs> it's a, it's a, and this is where religion, what we think of as religion, comes in. And I like to think, and I'm, my aspiration is that this is not a religious institution. That this is a place of practice and spiritual awakening. Um, so, bringing together the threads I want to today. Uh, I was raised Catholic. Partial Catholic. My father was Baptist, or he was basically a non-practicing Christian. So I only had the, my mother's side was Catholic, though I went to Catholic school for the first, 
until grade five. Um, so I did my first communion, and uh, I tried so hard to believe. In fact, I, I actually, years later, doing psychotherapy, I came upon a trauma that was a real trauma that when I was five years old, I took my first communion, and I didn't really believe that that little piece of bread was the body and blood of Christ. And I knew that I was the only person that didn't believe it, and then I had to, but I had to take it anyway, and I was lying, and I knew that if I took it, I, w if I'd, I knew I was going to go to hell. <laughs> and it was not a light experience, it was a terrifying experience, because I, I didn't, it didn't work. Now, it's not like that for everybody. The purpose of communion is to have the experience of becoming one with the Mass and to have a transpersonal experience. That's what it's designed to be. I didn't understand that, of course. Okay, getting to the point. Catholic childhood, that fell away in my teens. I became a, a and I, I got to worship there again in the last week at 12,000 feet. It's the church of the great blue sky, of the great blue dome. I became very enamored of the outdoors and found that I could have a quiet mind when I was traveling fast on skis. My maximum speed in the last week was 52 miles an hour. It was great, just for a moment, very safe. It was a marvelous place. Um, but when you're going fast, you're right here, right? You're right here. And then I encountered, I went to Nepal, and I encountered Buddhism and the Dharma, and, and I discovered that I could, I could practice the Dharma without believing anything. Though there's plenty to believe in Buddhism. I mean, there's a whole, there's a whole religion. Most Buddhists are religious. So, the stories. There's a story that's being celebrated all over the world today, and people are meeting one another and saying, rejoice, he is risen. And if you go into the front, one of the restrooms in the front, you have there a beautiful stained glass of the risen Christ. And people have, on many occasions, when I give them the tour, they've said, well, why, why, are you keeping that? And I say, well, of course, it's the Buddha. <laughs> so there's this story that has informed the lives and does today of, I forget how many, more than a billion, a billion and some people, which is this story of the crucifixion and death and uh, resurrection of Jesus and I want I invite you to notice what is your mind doing as I'm speaking about this it could be saying oh god not this or it could be curious but I invite you to hear this as mythology which is a map of the inner life which we can't talk about directly and so I did a little research well first the story right There's the whole Christmas and so on, and then the whole leading up to, and then the crucifixion. And for some people, this was the one, this is understood as the one son of God who was human but not human, and then crucified, which of course was the method of keeping the rabble down. Right? It's, how, it's how we dealt with with um, troublemakers back then, the Romans. Uh, normally they were put on the cross and they were left there. In fact, one of the questions of could this whole crucifixion, res resurrection story have happened was it would have been very unusual to let anyone take the body down. But that's another story. In the myth, in the story, uh, the body's taken down. The, uh, I forget his name right now. Um, a person offers his crypt, the body is put in the crypt, and uh, then in the morning the Marys come, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother, and they come and the stone has been rolled aside and there's an angel, there's a white luminous figure there who says he has risen. And then uh, there's, uh, in the next 40 days there are encounters 
with Jesus. In some cases, they don't recognize him at first, but there are encounters with him where he proves Thomas, I forget who it was, Doubting Thomas. He says to Thomas, put your fingers in the hole in my side. It really is me. And then he arose corporeally to be to sit at the right hand of the Father. And then there's the religious practice of believing in this. And because of this sacrifice, the, the Son of God made flesh, died. And because of that, if we believe on that adequately, we too can be freed of our sins and we too then will rise from the dead. At the time of the second coming, we'll come back up. That's quite a story, isn't it? And it helps many, many people make it through life because this nagging, terrible fear, which is I'm going to die, what's going to happen to me? So there's this amazing mythology which many people find very helpful. And they become very loving people because they want to participate in that. And I wanted to read a little bit about it. Here's a, here's a traditional Christian, pretty fundamentalist perspective. Why is the resurrection of Jesus Christ important? The resurrection of Jesus is, is important for several reasons. First, it witnesses to the immense power of God himself. To believe in the resurrection is to believe in God. If God exists and if he created the universe and has power over it, he has power to, to raise the dead. If he does not have such power, he's not a God worthy of our faith and worship. Only he who created life can resurrect it after death. Only he, it's rather he, isn't it? Only he, and I'm not going to correct the language because it's supposed to be this way. Only he can reverse the hideousness that is death itself. And only he can remove the sting that is death and the victory that is the graves. In resurrecting Jesus from the grave, God reminds us of his absolute sovereignty over life and death. Secondly, the resurrection of Jesus is a testimony to the resurrection of human beings, which is a basic tenet of the Christian faith. Unlike all other religions, Christianity alone possesses a founder who transcends death and who promises that his followers will do the same. All other religions were founded by men and prophets whose end was the grave. As Christians, we take comfort in the fact that our God became man, died for our sins, and was resurrected the third day. The grave could not hold him. He lives and he sits today at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. That's something to believe in. And for some people, it really works and helps. There's much more there. Then I wanted to read this. Biblical scholar Geza Vermes analyzes this subject in his book, The Resurrection. He concludes that there are eight possible theories to explain the resurrection. He outlines them as follows. I have discounted the two extremes that are not susceptible to rational judgment. The blind faith of the fundamentalist believer and the out of hand rejection of the inveterate skeptic. Blind belief or rejection. The fundamentalists accept the story not as written down in the New Testament texts, but as reshaped, retransmitted, and interpreted by church tradition. They smooth down the rough edges and abstain from asking tiresome questions. The unbelievers, in turn, treat the whole resurrection story as a figment of early Christian imagination. Most inquirers with a smattering of knowledge of the history of religions will find themselves between these two poles. From his analysis, Vermes presents us the remaining six possibilities to explain the resurrection of Jesus' account. The body was removed by someone unconnected with Jesus. The body was stolen by his disciples. The empty tomb was not the tomb of Jesus. Buried alive, he later left the tomb. Jesus recovered from a coma and departed Judea. And the possibility that there was a spiritual, not bodily resurrection. Yeah, I'll also post them to the net today. The body, so there's, I believe, and it's all bunk. Or number one, the body was removed by someone unconnected. The body of Jesus was stolen by the disciples. The empty tomb was not the tomb of Jesus. Buried alive, Jesus later left the tomb. Jesus recovered from a coma and departed Judea. 
and the possibility that there was a spiritual, not bodily res resurrection. Ten years or so, maybe 15 years or so, into my spiritual practice, I had the incredible privilege of attending two 10-day Zen Catholic sessions. The Zen teacher was Robert Aitken Roshi, the oldest American Zen Roshi, now deceased. And the uh, Catholic priest was Robert, uh, Father Bernard, who was the abbot of the Trappist, Trappist Abbey in Lafayette. And I had pretty much kind of closed the door on my Catholicism, though I still, when I traveled, in, like in Paris, I hung out in you know, Notre Dame. I always hung out in churches. They're great places to meditate. But what we did there was very intense zazen. What is mu? What is mu? Mu, mu. Uh, readings five times a day from the Catholic mystics. Catholic mystics? What Catholic mystics? I'd never heard of St. Teresa or Henri de Caussade or any of them. And what they were saying sounded a lot like the Dharma to me in Catholic language. And then each day we had mass in the church and it was at the Mary Knoll Sisters Church. In fact, this beautiful image here, I love this. This gorgeous picture of the goddess with the crescent, crescent moon in her Mary form, uh, archetypal image around the world, she's holding the baby. I did so much of my psychotherapy, actually, was around inner child work, and it was she with her gossamer shield of her cloth. It was she that would hold me when I was freaking out and... Uh, uh, very important in my own development. This was on the wall of my little cubicle at uh, the Mary Noel Sisters. And I asked if I could have it if I replaced it with one from the Trappist Abbey of uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe. And they agreed and I got to keep this. So this is, I encourage you, take a, take a picture. This is her, of course, in her Buddhist form, Kuan Yin. So, put it here. So I went into the church and I looked up and there at the front of the church was the Jesus on the cross of my childhood. Same production line. <laughs> really, it was the same one. And it had the thorns and the blood and the stab wound and the nails and he did not look happy. something very unexpected happened. I fell to my knees sobbing. Why? I had this incredible release of tension that of understanding what that was all about. After all my years of Buddhist practice, very intensive, you know, in Burma and in, in India and I mean, thousands and thousands of hours of Buddhist practice, I suddenly got it, oh, right. Take on a human body and you climb on the cross. It's not Jesus up there, it's me. And the only way out of here is death. Now, the Gnostics who were eliminated by the, the winners of the battle of what, would, what, the, what the Bible would consist of. The Gnostics said things like this. They didn't say that Jesus said, I am the one and only. It's that every single one of us is the son or daughter of God. But that was not politically acceptable and was eliminated in the first hundred years. The Gospel of Thomas, the Nag Hammadi text, emerged I don't know how long ago, 100 years ago or 70 years ago or so, you can read the Gospel of Thomas. And it's quite a different story of this person, Jesus. So anyway, back to my experience. Dukkha, there is suffering, is the cross. And it's the, the parallel is much closer than that even. So, so now, 
There's a Buddhist story. What's going to happen when I die? Well, if you're really good, you'll get a happy rebirth. If you're really bad, you'll get a bad rebirth. And you'll get to keep doing this. That's an interesting story, isn't it? That's religious Buddhism. There's a great book called Buddhism Without Beliefs by Stephen Batchelor, which when I read it, I was so relieved, someone of his stature, to say these things that made sense to me, that one doesn't have, you don't have to believe in future and past lives in order to practice deeply, because you can test it out today. If you act badly, harshly towards someone today, you'll get a harsh re response. You could, <laughs> this is my silly analogy, if you were to go out to I-205, which is not far away if you're driving, and just accelerate and go north, sun Sunday, there's not much traffic, and go north at about 90 or 100 miles an hour, I predict you will meet a handsome young person in, in an outfit and they have flashing lights, and, and you, can, you can create a karmic rebound by that. Or simply call some friend up that you haven't, go home to your partner or friend and tell them those things you've been really n not honest about. Just give it to them. <laughs> or act very kindly towards someone. Ask how they're doing. And you'll create a karmic response, a vipaka. So, What's the great myth of the Buddha say? He was born in the lap of luxury, it didn't work, he left, he abandoned, he left, he, he went on, on a retreat, uh, left his wife and child, and uh, went to practice with the jhana masters, the great concentration masters in the forest. That led to concentration and bliss, but didn't set him free. There was still the problem of birth, sickness, old age, decay, and death. Having experiences he didn't want, not having experiences he did want, being with people he didn't want, and not being with the person or persons he did want. Dukkha, unsatisfactoriness. Well, first, before that, he was born in Brahminical Hinduism, and it didn't work for him. There's a great book. We have two or three copies in the library called The Lady of the Lotus. And it's the story of the life of the Buddha from his wife, Yashodra's perspective. It's really beautiful. I highly recommend it. In it, she watched him becoming more and more distressed as he encountered the way of the world, things falling apart. And one day he was walking on the, on the foundation of an old castle and he was musing, this is going to happen to our castle too. We're not permanent. We're going to die. And he became depressed. He became quite, he was having a, um, a spiritual uh, awakening, or a spiritual toil. And he became so obsessed with it, he actually left being a prince and went off into a spiritual quest. He took his question very seriously. He then went off to the jhana masters, and then the idea was around then, which it still exists in a way. Well, I tried feeding the senses, luxury, uh, I tried developing tremendous concentration. What if I just stopped nourishing my senses? What if I just fasted extremely? What if I slept outside without any clothing or without any covers? What if I, what if I really, really starve this thing? Maybe then I'll become free of attachment to it. She's an extremist. And he tried that, and they, it, the story goes he did that for years until he became what he called a one grain of rice a day man. This is the classic story. You can see statues in India, and pictures on the net, of course, of the, of the starving Buddha and his, 
and his stomach is hollow, you can see his spine. He said, I starved myself so severely I could reach my spine. But he still had, he was still clinging to life. Having watched, not so long ago, a year and a bit, Ruth Dennison pass away, she was 11 days with no food or water. And there was this, the body just clinging to life. Just, it's, in a certain way, it's difficult to, to end a life. So, he, uh, the story goes that he starved himself so severely that he, he went into the river Naranjana, which flows through Bodh Gaya, it, when it rains a lot, uh, and he almost died because he couldn't climb out. But he managed to get out and then enter the feminine, a, a young woman named Sujata showed up with, the, with a bowl of milk rice. And it's, it's, it's not just an ordinary milk rice. You can see the mythology in this. It's the milk from a hundred cows that were somehow distilled and fed to three cows that were somehow distilled and fed to one cow and then this bowl of milk rice came out of it. Now that's high potency. Uh, it's like mother's milk, right? It's, it's the perfect fuel for a human being, a baby. So, so uh, Siddhartha ate this and then she and her father nursed him back to health. And then, and get the parallel with the Jesus story, then he decided, he had this memory that when he was a child, his father was carving the first furrow in the ground in the, the, the spring planting festival. The worms were being kicked out and the birds were coming and eating them and he wandered away and sat under a tree and entered a kind of reverie which was wide away, effortless mindfulness, uh, non, choiceless awareness. And he thought, maybe that's the way to go. Right, so he's tried luxury, concentration, fasting. So he took himself to the foot of a tree, the Bodhi tree, and sat down there and made a vow, I am going to sit here till I die or I awaken. Enter the crucifixion, it's the same story. He sat down under the tree and Mara comes along and tempts him with, the, with the sensual desires and, and with anger and hatred and with uh, responsibility. Why are you not checking your email this morning? You should be at work. And in every case, he said, no, I have another destiny. And I think, the, is that Buddha touching the ground? The, the, the dark one? It's not an earth touching Buddha? No. Um, there's a very common image of the, the Buddha with his right hand touching the ground. So Mara says, I'm going I'm, I'm to hinder you from awa awakening. And Siddhartha says, not likely. I take the earth as my witness. I've done what it takes. And Siddhartha died. And then there was the Buddha. Now he didn't die corporeally but something of a different order emerged, which was a person who was awake to the reality of life and death. And then he taught for 42 years. It's the same story. It's how do we transcend death? What is it about us that isn't born? In Zen they say, what, is your, what was your face before you were born? And I love this quote from, this is from Alan Watts. Go away. This feeling of being lonely and very temporary visitors in the universe is in flat contradiction to everything known about man and all other living organisms in the sciences. We do not come into this world, we come out of it. As leaves come out of a tree, as the ocean waves the universe peoples, every individual is an expression of the whole realm of nature, a unique action of the total universe. 
So I remember as a child thinking, where do I come from? Right? And where do we come from? I still wonder that, don't you? A sperm and an egg come together and then consciousness somehow comes in and then we get born and then we go through somebody training for a long time and then we get very possessive of certain people and things and then pff, it all falls apart. What's going on? I don't know how to say this next piece. One of the stories I remember from my very first retreat was the Buddha speaking to the Kalamas. He was traveling in the hill country and he entered a village and they said, why should we believe you? Because you're the third holy man to come through in the last couple of months. And they disparage each other and tell us not to believe the other ones. And his response was really remarkable because he said, by all means, do not believe me. But also, don't, don't, uh, don't go into skeptical disbelief don't close your mind, but instead try the practice. And if it leads to the reduction of greed, hatred, and ignorance, and suffering and pain in yourself, then it's probably good. If it does the same for your loved ones, if it actually starts affecting the people around you, then it's even likely better. And then if it actually is good for everybody, then it's a worthy practice to follow. But you know that because you've done it yourself, not because you're believing in something. Oh, he also said, don't believe it because it's traditional, uh, important, I don't, it isn't in the Kalama Sutra, but don't believe it because it comes from somebody charismatic. Because we can, we can get hypnotized by people's charisma and enthusiasm and so on, but take it in and try it ourselves. So I, um, I have found in myself a synthesis of my love of science and my great uh, love of nature. This quote speaks of the love of nature, right? But what are we? We're, I use my classic in my traditional image of a droplet. We're a droplet, we're a piece of the earth that got born and we're living and we have a case of terrible, a terrible case of mistaken identity. We think we're separate, but we're not separate. So far today I've had food and water and connection with people and I've, I, I, am, I am the living earth, you are the living earth. We are the sons and daughters of the universe. We are the divine manifestation of life and love. We're capable of love. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? When we practice generosity, we're just giving ourselves back and forth to each other. You know, love thy neighbor as thyself, not metaphorically, but because they are ourselves. Now, what's this? This elusive peace. Ah. With Father Bernard, I had lots of conversations with him after those retreats. I went to, did weekend retreats and so on out at the Trappist Abbey. He told me, among other things, that the, the, for the priest, there's no room for personal flourish. The mass is the same and should be exactly the same every time, 
with the exception of the readings, including every hand gesture. It's mudra practice. And it's always the same with the purpose of calming the personality with the intention of bringing the focus in such that there's a, at that moment of the host, as they call it, being placed on the tongue, there's a, a, a transpersonal experience where one becomes one with the mass. Where, flipping Buddhist, where the sense of separate identity dissolves and one, ex one experiences oneself as everything spoken of in our Theravadan language is realizing that everything is impermanent, that nothing through the sense doors can possibly satisfy us. And also, and the key one, that ultimately there's no separateness, that we are the living earth, we are the universe manifesting as separate identities. And that not as theory or not as something to believe on, but to experience directly. So there's this whole thrust in the meditative tradition, in the Buddhist tradition, to practice such that we have a direct experience of freedom, right? There's suffering, there's the cause of suffering, there's the end of suffering. There's nirvana, which is the quenching of the desire for things to be different, which increasingly I, I like to think of or articulate as it's, such a blessing, it's the ultimate blessing to have a moment of dissolving. A moment of realizing what we are, which is everything. And we could, there's the other terminology of realizing, what are we really? Well, we are love, we are compassion. It's, it's simply who we are. Except when we're in our somebody training. It's hard to talk about, you can't talk about this directly. But we all know, what's it like when you meet someone in love? Oh, Jennifer shared with me something she, someone sent it to her, maybe it was on Facebook. Of they have people, uh, I'll put this on the listserv too, it's uh, what happens when people stop and gaze into each other's eyes for four minutes? Love happens. We do that on, on retreats with some frequently. I stop, we stop and we dance perhaps and we see. When we stop and meet another person, what are, what's meeting what? Like, oh, I wonder if I can do this. See. Please be aware of your own face. You can't. Why? Because what you are is consciousness. If you look up here, what are you? Your awareness. It's an odd way to think, but it's, it's true. Someday we'll do an exercise, about extended exercise about that. So when you meet another person, it's two consciousnesses meeting. And we have stories and we, we reify each other and well, you're this and I'm this. And, but if we pause and put, let, let our fear subside, we meet. That's the moment of communion. Similarly, we're going to go back, and there's quite a feed back there today. I don't know what happened, but it's, <laughs> it's a bit feastish. Um, it's the Easter feast. Yes. Uh, I, we, we, <laughs> we're missing the hat thing. It'd be nice to have the hat thing it's on, e <laughs> on Easter's. Both genders, we could all wear nice hats, ex exotic hats. But when you go back, I invite you that the, the uh, whatever bite of food you get. Take it as communion. It's you participating in life. You're taking in the body of the living earth. And in that moment, why not have a transpersonal experience and go completely beyond separate identity? And then come back to the conversation. Or continue the conversation in that place of ease and joy and um, it's all the opposite of fear. So, happy Easter. Well, Easter, of course, is Passover. 
time. And it's, guess what? The rebirth of life. Everything's coming back to life. Everything you haven't pruned yet, it's time. Okay. Um, let's close with a little chant together. I, get, I want to say one more thing. I believe it's of great importance to understand from a transpersonal perspective and therefore be able to validate everyone's story. We say it in different ways. Could you ask him to wait a minute? I want to say a couple more things. I had a beautiful encounter with a young woman at, in, uh, in Denver. She was wearing the Muslim hajib, hajab, hajib. And I approached her to get my muffins and I said, as I would do, assalamu alaikum. And she looked back and said, oh, wa alaikum assalam. And she said, you speak Arabic? And I said, no, but I've traveled, traveled in Muslim countries. And uh, I've been so struck by the kindness and friendliness of the Muslim world. And, and then I took a risk and I said, I'm so sorry for how the ignorance in my country is treating you and some people like you. And she talked about how every day she comes through security and they treat her differently and badly. They get, she gets a serious pat down every time because she's dressing a little differently. We're going mad. The culture is going insane, or it's showing its insanity. And this is one of the reasons why it's so important that we understand other people's stories. That we understand the myth that underlies their culture, because Islam is a tradition of love, just like Christianity and just like Buddhism. And there's craziness and there's insanity, in this, but there's craziness and insanity on all sides. So that was part of why I wanted to talk about Easter, that it's, it's, we're, all, we're all making sense of this desperate isolation that we have without spiritual understanding, and not, it's not so common that we have spiritual understanding. Okay, thank you. Please let's, oh, let's, do, let's get the kids in and we'll do the chant together. Let's stay seated for now. Come on, kids. Yay, kids, come on in. So we're going to do it a little differently today, kids. To start with, we're going to do a chant, and it goes like this. There's three sounds. Who is one, and it vibrates in the heart. Try that together. Who, and then it moves to the throat. Ah, and then to the crown. Om. And let's do it together a few times. At first, we'll do it in, harmo in, in synchrony, and then not. Then you breathe, and you, it will become quite um, harmonious. So together. And then breathing at your own pace.
for that chant, I thank the Sufis, the mystical tradition coming out of Islam. So, please let's form a big circle, a little circle in the middle. Any, anyone posing as an adult who would like to join us with the kids is more than welcome. Did we have fun today? I saw you outside planting something. Kind of a new side pine cone war. You're having a pine cone war. Well, that's good. <laughs> and you what? And she punched me in the back twice. Punched you in the back twice. I see. Well, it sounds like a great morning. <laughs> Please. You, you were planting? Wheatgrass. Wheatgrass. Great. It's a nice day to be planting. May I have your hand? Thank you. Please find a hand to left and right. And maybe we can take two hands. There we go. That's good. Isn't it lovely to have hands? Because then we can connect with each other. So please become aware of the contact with the hand to your right and give it a little squeeze and wish this person well. We're capable of thinking anything, so why not think, oh, I hope you're happy today. I hope you're healthy. Hope your dr dreams and wishes come true. And then to the other side, giving that hand a squeeze. What would you wish for this person? Remembering our topic today of coming and going. The fact that we're all only here for an eye blink. What would you wish? What would your prayer be? And then sending this energy, imagining this energy going around the circle in your right hand and out your left hand so that you connect with everybody in the room. And in fact, with everyone who's ever been in this room since 1930, including your loved ones and friends, the people you think of as your enemies, In fact, all human beings, all of our brothers and sisters of the air, the earth, and the waters, to all of us, we're all in this soup together. And so now we have the, if this will work, please work. Yes, do we have chanters over there? Yes, wonderful. So when you're ready, you lead us. May all beings be happy. Three times. May all beings be happy. <laughs> May all beings be happy. May all beings be happy. Sadhu. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, and now we come to the highlight of the morning. Everyone, please make a wish and take in a giant breath. The whole group has to help. Not yet. I have to count. Now we're going to practice patience. Taking in a great breath. One. Two, three, blow. Yes, our wish is granted. <laughs> so please come and have some goodies and a chat. And see you soon. Oh, and greet, greet the person to your left and right, please. How'd it go? It went really well. Good. I was, I was, I was, I was,